Good morning, guys. Uh, you're watching Here Come the Irish. I'm Michael Owens. Today, we'll be joined once again by head Notre Dame baseball coach, Link Jarrett. Um, we talked to him last year. Very excited to uh, discuss and recap last spring, as well as preview the 2021 baseball season. Um, give me one second. We'll get him on the line. Once again, head Notre Dame baseball coach Link Jarrett joins the podcast today. Hello. Hey, good morning, Link. This is uh, Mike Loans with Here Come the Irish. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you, Michael. How are you? I'm doing great. Hey, um, before we uh, dive into previewing the 2021 baseball season, I really want to touch back on what happened last spring, that hot start you guys got off to. Uh, 11-2 and two start, swept North Carolina on the road. Um, just how much fun did your team have last year, and what did you uh, learn about your players in Season 1? Well, number one, when you have to implement entirely new systems across the board um, with new coaches, none of us had ever coached before, and Chuck had been on staff and, and knew the pitching staff and knew the players and, and knew um, what had gone on. Um, but implementing an entirely new system was, was tricky. And it was fun to watch that take shape. It, it's a challenge to, to put things in, like, across the board like we did. Um, it obviously worked. In a short sample size, it worked. I, you know, we, we've got a long way to go. It's not a finished product by any stretch. But it was fun. And I think the guys just saw some of the things that we – had worked on in our training and some of the concepts that we have in place within our systems, and you saw it. You saw it play out, and a lot of the things that we worked on, we actually were able to do in the games, and, and those don't always present themselves in a 13-game span. But in this case, I, I felt like a lot of the things that we wanted to see happen throughout the course of the year, we saw in a short period of time. So it was really. It was really fun. Um, I felt like we played a little bit better each week of the season. And, you know, our training is, is indoors, and luckily we have great facilities to, to be indoors, and occasionally we can roll outside and get a few days in. Um, but to go on the road like that and, shoot, we were all over the country playing these games, and then you're, you're coming back. Each time we got off the plane, I, I felt like we played better. And, I mean, I, I guess a lot of coaches would <laughs> hope the same thing happens. But when you have so much newness, um, you just want to see it play out and see the guys take the instruction and the concepts and put them into the games, and, and, and we saw it. That was fun. The guys enjoyed it. Moved some personnel around, maybe in different positions, and you have, you know, like a brain again that comes in one of your more athletic guys, and, and he helped solidify some athleticism and range on the left side of the infield, which helped. Um, so it was it was really enjoyable and, you know, obviously unfortunate that it ended when it did, but at least it ended on a positive note. Yeah, and it's kind of crazy. You said 11-2 and two start and kind of traveling across the country. You didn't even play a single game at home. I understand that that's not a huge competitive advantage in baseball, but nevertheless, 11-2 and two start – all those wins on the road or neutral site. Um, how excited or I should say, how disappointed were you, the coaching staff and the players? Because I know uh, you guys were, I believe, at the top 25 and you're about to head to Louisville that next week and then all the COVID kind of ended the season. How disappointed were the guys? You know, they were crushed. And to be honest with you, when we when we got on the bus and left Louisville to, to come back to South Bend, I don't think anybody on that bus thought the season was over. <laughs> you know, you just – when we broke camp here to go home, it it didn't seem like that was it. You knew it, there was going to be a break, but I, I guess initially you're hoping, okay, this is a, you know, a three-week pause. Let's, you know, figure out exactly what's going on. And maybe my head was in the sand because you're just trying to coach and function within your program and the, win games. But when it hit that this was really it, and it, it was crushing to the guys. And, and there were guys that had real draft implications affected by this. When you have a five-round draft instead of 40, there, there were guys that were definitely, definitely top 10 draft picks on our team that are back. So it's a pretty deep 
void that that was left when it was reality of the conclusion of the season. So um, it was it was it was a kind of a heartbreaking stretch, but it, it wasn't one moment initially like at Louisville where you thought the the whole season was over. So you, you with me? Yeah, I completely understand. I mean, without that all broke out there in the spring, everyone yeah. was kind of up in the air with what was going on. Um, you've already been t- talking yeah. about this. Um, you mentioned to us, us last spring we had you on the podcast, and it was really awesome to see last year um, winning in all kinds of different ways. Um, once again, everybody watching live, we're here with Notre Dame head baseball coach Link Jarrett. I'm going to go off some stats real quick here just to show different ways that you guys were winning last season. So if Spencer Myers, he had 15 stolen bases, six in one game. Um, reminds me like Carl Crawford there against the Red Sox. But uh, first in the NCAA, um, Nico Cavadas um, in 13 games, seven home runs, 17 RBIs. Um, Tommy Sheehan, 3-0, 2.70 ERA, 22 strikeouts, and a, basically a 200 opponent batting average. So you guys are winning in all kinds of different ways. Can you touch on um, the versatility of the program? Yeah, you know, it, it's trying to put people in the right spot to succeed and then – everybody's individualized with what they can and can't do. So you have to try to coach each guy to bring out the best within his skill set. And Spencer Myers is as different a player as Nico Cavadas. They couldn't be more different. So each of them have tremendous value when you see them play within that capability. And Nico's got to hit the ball over the fence, and Spencer Myers needs hit the ball on the ground and hit line drives and find ways on base because he manufactures and pressures people and creates offense through that facet where Nico, you know, it's the big damaging blow. And the the neat part of a you know that type of mixture is the one helps the other. You know, when you've got Spencer on base, you know, throwing breaking balls or expanding the zone or, you know, two strike pitches that are in the dirt become more risky when you're pitching. I mean, you could, you have a base running threat. So the more the more pressure that top of the order can create, the middle of the order tends to maybe get better pitches to hit throughout the long haul. So that that was fun to watch. And and you know you got Jared Miller and Prizner and Brannigan and Kofi. There's just a great variety within the lineup and it's fun to coach that you know if you have all one dimension um i think it's easier to to game plan against your team but you know we did have a good mix and you saw guys take some nice strides in their development within that stretch she hands good live fastball um, good starting candidate um slider good change up is coming on you know you, you feel good going into the weekend with him out there Tommy Vale was really a special, unique talent for us, the way we used him. He and Boyle were kind of our leverage guys, and we would use them early, middle, and late to get out of trouble because you felt like they had the firepower to make critical pitches and get strikeouts. So that that was helpful. And I think you're going to see you know another guy in those leverage spots this year, Tanner Colehep. Cole up is, I, I think, the correct pronunciation there. He uh, was at Tennessee and uh, went to Iowa Western, a good junior college, for a semester, and we were able to sign him. And it's right-handed, really nasty, some velocity, good cutter, slider, change-up. So adding that into the, into the equation in the middle will, will help offset the loss of Boyle. Brannigan has developed. His velocity has been up to 99. If you round it up, he's thrown the ball 100 miles an hour. Um, Mejias, Mercer, you know, we've got some options. So you feel good there. And and the grad transfers, when you bring in, um, you know, Cam Brown, who who is back. Now, he's a grad for us. He was out all year last year. He was a weekend starter, left-handed pitcher that's racked up some really impressive numbers here. John Michael Bertrand, um, Furman grad transfer, left-handed, very experienced, pitchability lefty. Christian Scafidi was the pitcher of the year in the Ivy League, I think in 2019. So 
So he's a grad that could be a starter, and Joe Sheridan is a grad transfer from UCF, left-handed. So you like the depth, and you like the fact that you have so many left-handed pitchers that you can rely on. So it's going to be fun. Coach, heading into your second season, um, how much more comfortable are you with things like um, the strength conditioning, player expectations? Um, last spring you are talking about like basically base, baseball IQ, bunk coverages, relays, situational baseball. How much more comfortable are you now that um, everyone kind of knows your system, um, besides maybe like the, tr- the true freshman coming in and some transfers? How mo- much more comfortable are you with the expectations and everything like that? I'm so much more comfortable with – my staff's understanding of what we're trying to do. Um, I'm so much more comfortable with having coached now two falls and, and part of the season, but the two falls here are critical. We had a great fall. Um, we trained from day one to the last day possible without a pause, which is a testament to our players buying in. It's a testament to Scott Stansberry, our athletic trainer. Kyle Jean, strength and conditioning, grouping our guys up. It was a puzzle that enjoyably fit together nicely when you, when you look at how the semester went. Um, but this would have been really tough had this been my first year. And thankfully, to have that first calendar year under my belt and to acclimate myself and to acclimate everybody around us it it really made things a lot easier and once your players have been through your practices and your meetings and your philosophy they can help the new guys adapt when you're trying to teach it to 40 people around you um and everybody is hearing it for the first time that's why last fall and last spring was challenging but it it was fun to see the fruits of some of that labor for sure, um, I was watching a podcast on replay um, that you, you did a couple here, a couple months back, and I heard you mention being strong up the middle. Um, for you guys watching, being strong up the middle, um, referring to catching, pitching, middle infielders, and uh, the center fielder. It's kind of funny that you said that because I, I, um, I coach high school baseball with some older coaches. I'm like, no one says that anymore. That's like, that's like old baseball terms. But I heard you mention that a couple months ago. Um, can you just talk about being strong up the middle? Well, it starts on the mound. So, I mean, you don't get more in the middle than that. And and those guys have to be able to feature quality stuff. They have to obviously be able to throw strikes. I think at this level you hope you're beyond the hoping we throw strikes concept. But you're trying to execute pitches. And the quality of this stuff combined with the quality of the execution really determines how effective you are on the mound. Um, I think we're in good shape there with some depth. Behind the plate, um, we needed to drastically improve our performance behind the plate. Not a secret. Um, Lamana is back. He's a tough out at the plate. I think Rich Wallace, who is our recruiting coordinator and works with the catchers, they, they've really cleaned some things up back there. You add um, Alex Brate, a grad transfer. You add Nick Jewer, a 4-2-4. He was at TCU and then Iowa Western switch hitter. And Danny Neri, a very impressive catch-and-throw freshman, I feel like we have stabilized the catching position. So pitching and catching, most important. And then, like you saw last year, we moved Preisner to shortstop, which is where he actually played in high school. Um, he played a lot of second base here when he was, when he was out there. Um, and we thought Miller, with his quickness and maybe the ability to – to turn the double play and, and have some, some good range, maybe take some of the pressure off of the longer throws for him, thought that would help. So I like that combination in the middle. They're very intelligent players. And then Spencer in center field um, is, is very quick. He closes on the ball well. We've worked very hard on his breaks and jumps. And the center fielder really has the best advantage in tracking the pitch and reading the swing and getting a jump. And Spencer was originally an infielder, so he's still learning the fine points of the art of, you know, that jump and the swing and did the guy take a, you know, hit the ball at the end of the bat versus barrel it? Did he get jammed? Sometimes the swing um, can fool you a little bit, so the repetition and the sound and the look will help him continue to grow. But 
that's that's strong in the middle. And and I'll say next on that list is right field because there's so many balls that end up in right center field and kind of in that shallow right field area. Brooks Coatsy, I'll tell you what, last year some of the plays he made at critical moments to save extra base hits drastically changed our season. Phenomenal. So the middle was good, but I, I will also say it was very above average in right field with Brooks out there. Played great. Completely, uh, completely agree with that. Um, and then kind of transitioning a little bit, you were mentioning the, the recruiting. Um, oh, sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, it looks like you guys got, got a top 25 class, and I saw on social media, I'm not sure if this is true or not, the first uh, top 25 uh, class in program history possibly – um, so obviously that's the first part of it is recruiting. Um, congratulations on that. But and then the development obviously is the next step, which we've been t- uh, discussing. But how excited are you, are you for these um, future players that you, uh, you recruited this last cycle? It's a great class. You know, we've got some good young arms that um, athletic, uh, very talented, explosive, you know, they're, they're draft candidates. I, I think we will shore up – kind of our infield depth we still lack infield depth um and i think we we've solved some of that um i'm i'm very impressed with what we were able to do and you know these guys are going to they're they're coming into a system now where the older guys will be able to help them but the guys we've signed from all over the country when you look at guys from california huntington beach to panama city beach florida and up and down it's very impressive what Rich and Chuck were able to, to do. And, I, and obviously I have my hands in it, but those two guys over the long haul tracking and measuring and gathering info on players that fit everything Notre Dame represents is, is really a, a fun challenge. And watching those guys buy into what you're doing, like from all over the place, it, it was remarkable. And, you know, that class is just going to be another step in the right direction for us turning this into a championship program. The draft, you know, you, there, there's that facet for us where these guys don't have to come to college. So, you know, you have to continue to track on their development and their progress because, um, you know, as, as they turn themselves into top 50 type players, then, then you potentially are looking at, uh, have they gotten themselves into the top three or four round discussion in the draft? So that's, that's one thing we have to deal with in our sport that's very unique. But you have to sign that caliber of player to have a chance to move up the, the rankings nationally and in the ACC, plain and simple. Yeah, like you said, there's those a uh, couple rounds in the MLB draft now. It's not where uh, Mike Piazza is getting uh, drafted in the second, uh, 62nd round and um, making the baseball hall of fame, but um, what what is your uh, pitch to these high school players? Um, is it a little bit of the academics? Um, you hit on the success last season, or where the future of the program is going? What are some of the the biggest pitch you would say to a high school guy um, getting him to go to the Irish? Well, the academic piece very important. The faith piece very attractive. The baseball development and the coaching and all of the parts that that you sell personally as a coach and each one of our coaches sells within the area that they instruct it's all just so critical there's not one overriding piece that um, attracts recruits to the school it's multifaceted and Notre Dame represents so many beautiful pieces to the families and to the player but they have to trust and buy into what you're doing coaching wise. I mean, that you only get one shot at this as a potential career. And, you know, they have to feel like, I think that, that this is headed in the right direction. They have to buy into your coaching philosophies. Um, and, and I think it's important for those guys to see that they feel like there's a chance that they can play early in their career. And, um, we're not over recruiting and we're, we're not looking to have 55 players like some other schools in the ACC and SEC do. It's not a nonstop tryout. I think that is valuable for people to know and trust that that's not the case. 
right now in this COVID world, everybody's got more on the team. The NCAA relaxed the roster limits, but that's not really the big picture plan for us moving forward. And I think parents and players, they find that comfortable as well. So I, I think there's just so many layers to making the decision. And then they have to trust that you're in it for the betterment of the student athlete, which there's no doubt that we all. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point you touched on there. Anyone um, around college baseball, if you have that many players on your roster, like you're saying some other schools do, it's just, it's just no fun. Like you said, it's just a continuous tryout and you're not having fun with it. Um, kind of transition here. I got a few more questions I'd like to touch on for um, before we get you off here. But the scheduling, I looked on the, the website today. I didn't see a schedule up. Um, do you have any idea if it's just going to be ACC teams only or maybe some non-conference or as well as when do you think there'll be a timeline for that to be released? Well, unfortunately, I think if you look at the timeline for the other sports, I, I wouldn't be surprised if ours is not finalized till after the new year. Now, I think the longer you can wait to make these decisions, the better off you are. Now, we have a schedule on paper. And we've had three or four ACC committee coaches and administrators conference calls to try to have plan A, plan B, plan C. But you really can't put any of this in motion just yet. So we have a schedule. Um, I cannot release that. You know, we're not in a position to even really publicly discuss it yet because there's so much variation in where this could go you know if if you extend the ACC weekends then obviously that changes the front of your schedule I don't think right now the ACC is interested in moving it back Um, but if there's a reason to move it back altogether move it back um, then that that's a huge move I, I think ESPN and television with Wimbledon has always been a sticking point for moving the College World Series. So I think if you look at where the College World Series could go, I think where it was placed by design helped the networks and gave you the best chance for visibility for the sport. So um, I think there's been very basic discussion on the possibility of maybe moving it back, but I think that's probably a stretch. So I'm not giving you a concrete answer, and I don't know that we will have one in the next month, to be honest. I bet it comes after the new year, and maybe that's the right thing. The vaccine, you you hope that something becomes available sooner than later. I don't know that that comes into play for for college athletics this calendar year, but, you know, you, you turn on the news and read, every day something has changed. So I think the longer we can wait, the, the more accurate you become with what the right move is. And assuming that there's going to be a season, what are your goals or expectations for the season? Um, do you guys have a list on the board? Do you want to make like the ACC championship or um, just make the NCAA tournament and kind of go from there and make some noise in the tournament? What's like your, a few of your uh, goals for the program uh, this upcoming season? Our most important goal is an at-large NCAA tournament berth. That shows that from the first game of the year to the last pitch of the year, you were competitive. And if you are competitive first pitch to last in this league, you're in. And that that's my goal because you don't wait till ACC play starts. Like, if you're going to be good at this and be in a national discussion, you have to play well out of the game. And that's why I've always approached the season in, in that context um, because that, that truly represents long-term, season-wide competitive success. That's how I look at it. So that, you know, I, I looked at our team last year, the third game at UAB. I mean, we're just trying to figure out how this is going to work with our team and they didn't quite grasp the magnitude of the Sunday game at UAB. You win Friday, you you should have won Saturday, you didn't. That Sunday game is, they need to approach that as a must win, got to come out of there on the road, two out of three, have to, must turn it up. And we had about a 20-minute session before we left the hotel on just simply that. If our goal is to be an NCAA team, 
we must go out today and we must win the game and the story. And the, the silence that I heard and the way they were still, like as we talked about this, I don't know that they grasped the magnitude of what was going to happen when you got off the bus on the first Sunday of the season. So that's why I go about it the way I do. And, you know, <laughs> we were on the right track, and hopefully we can pick up where we left off. Yeah, certainly for sure. Like I said, I was definitely excited to go down there and watch you guys at Louisville. Unfortunately, that series got um, uh, never got played. But I'm definitely excited for um, the spring season, what's coming up here in the next few months. Um, so a few other, qu- few more questions for you. I'll let you go. Um, when do the boys actually get back on campus um, um, this for the for the next season? As of now, we've got clearance to return January fifteenth. Now, with the semester being pushed later. Um, with a February 3rd class day, we will begin training like without being in school, which is really unheard of. January 15th would be the first day you could start any sort of baseball training. So if you're not in school, that would be the date. If you're in school before the 15th, you can begin your training when school starts. So um, this will be the first time in my career where school has started after the training day so that'll be unique um and it might be great i I haven't really been through it so getting the guys back and trying to build in times around the clock with no class you you'd have to think that would be pretty fun you got a little spring training um so that's when we'll come back is the 15th and we'll have this thing lined up and um you get to to start your work with no class which is going to be new Absolutely. Um, less than two months until that date here. I'm definitely excited for baseball to be back um, this spring, college baseball. Um, so last question I get here from you. Um, so speaking with you the last couple of times, it's obviously um, how passionate you are about college baseball and specifically Notre Dame. So how, how awesome is it for you or how fun is it just making a living to be in the head baseball coach at Notre Dame? You know, I, I look over at my wife periodically and She's actually on her way back from Tuscaloosa. My daughter's a freshman down there in Alabama, so they're they're driving up. And my my son is flying from Raleigh. He's a he's a COVID senior at NC State, so I guess he has another year. But technically, he could be a a senior in the classroom. Um, I look over at her and I said, you know, I coach at the best university in the world. I'm the baseball coach at the best university in the world, and um, such a blessing. And, and to see this university, like, kind of wrap their hands around this semester and, and keep the kids in person school and to watch our football team function the way they have. Lance Taylor's my next door neighbor and such a great family that we get to speak with and hang out with. And, and to watch the whole Notre Dame community rally around this semester but it just nails my point to my wife that this is the most special place that you could ever coach and, and you know, my job now is to is to turn the baseball program into a championship caliber program well uh, it was it was great having you on thanks for all your um, thoughts and answers on these all these questions here um, best of luck coming up here with all this COVID going on and battling through that in the spring season coming up. I'm sure there'll be a lot of changes over the next few months. Um, I'm hoping that I get to see you guys um, in person this year um, and maybe meet you guys in person for once. Um, I know I was going to maybe ask to see that do that at one point, but um, hopefully you guys um, have a great season this spring and best of luck. And thanks again once uh, for coming on the podcast. Michael, thank you. Anytime you need me, I'd be happy to speak with you and you know, thank you for what you do for all of Notre Dame athletics. I really appreciate it. I hope you and your family have a great Thanksgiving and uh, go Irish. Go Irish. Thanks, Michael. Once again, that was head Notre Dame baseball coach, Link Jarrett. Thanks for everyone uh, watching the podcast. I'll put it up and um, go Irish.